Hello, everybody. This is the Alchemy of Life podcast, and I have a very special guest today. Her name is Laura, and she is an embodiment teacher. She is leading workshops. She is working with people one on one. She is a facilitator in ISTA, the International School of Temple Arts. She's a tantrica, and I have a feeling we have a lot of interesting things to discuss today on embodiment, intimacy, the sacredness in our body and that we can discover with each other and so on. Um, yeah, I'm excited for this. How are you doing today, Laura? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. Just wanna, I just want to maybe uh, rectify a little bit. I'm not a facilitator of Easter. I'm an apprentice facilitator. I don't want to have like troubles with this stuff yeah. Sure. yeah 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 i'm familiar with how the organization works um yeah um, yeah so yeah. that you have facilitated some workshops in ista so uh, yeah yeah beautiful yeah. Um, well, thank you for inviting me and it's true that we don't really know each other but i'm sure that we have a lot in common and a lot to maybe share with others mm. beautiful so um I don't know, maybe start from uh, where it all started for you. What brought you where to where you're at doing this beautiful work with people? Uh, well, I, I, I don't come from there. And I feel like many of us probably don't really come from embodiment, except when they were really young. But uh, very quickly, um, you know, we, we lost that connection maybe to the body and to the intuition and to the wisdom of the body. And as everyone... I mean, as many people, I went a lot into my mind and academic studies. I was a psychologist for some years. So it was all about uh, the mind. Um, and I was kind of protected by this, this desk in between me and my client uh, at the time. But um, it all started for me with a sickness, actually, with a cancer when I was 18. And, you know, that actually obliged me to go and, and check with it, not just with my mind, but starting to understand why and how this body works and and what, what what it is saying basically and how to discover the codes of the body so you know after psychology after many after the, a decade of psychology i start traveling like everyone probably and uh saturn return at 27 just leave everything around and and just start the the path you know of like not knowing what to discover but knowing that there is something way bigger that is awaiting and yeah, and I discovered a tantric school. I stayed there for years, and that was the, you know, the dominoes, basically. Yeah. You said like everyone, but uh, I would uh, beg to differ that not everyone are going on a path. I mean, everybody are going on a path. Um, I don't know if everybody are consciously going out there and seeking answers and seeking you know, to open up more. A lot of people are kind of like stuck where it's comfortable for them and mm. yeah i feel that the term embodiment has been thrown around a lot as of late but i think in specifically in this conversation it meant going back to the body the, the innate intelligence that the body holds that permeates through the entire universe and makes your body as well which has nothing to do with what you can capture with your intellect when you realize that it does put you on a path um was this in India that you uh, did you discover Tantra? Yeah, I did. Like I was, like, and actually I was in Thailand. I mean, in India, I just started to do all kind of meditation and yoga things. But then it was in Thailand that I discovered Tantra. And then I was just going between India and Thailand constantly. In, in Kopangan, yeah. eh? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I just actually lived in Kopangan for the past uh, almost two years. Um, mm -hmm. Just left to Berlin, which is where I am now. Um, I've been to Kopangan for many years, never been in the Tantra circles much, but it's impossible to ignore the Tantric aura that this island have. Maybe you want to give the audience a little bit of an introduction of what is even Tantra from your perspective, from your experience. Yeah, I'll, I'll say more about my experience, because even though, you know, I've been trained in like classical Tantra for many years, I feel like I've taken myself out of any kind of, um, I don't even, I don't even consider myself 
like a tantric or a tantric teacher anymore you know it's like I just take myself out away of every kind of stigma or dogma so just for me tantra is just like an an, an an awareness that everything which is inside is outside and what everything that is outside is inside so for me it's like a way of living that is an inclusive reality that is not uh separated from anything else but mm. for many years for me that has been just like a mental concept even though i wanted to believe that through my practices i was aware of that but actually i feel like it's just <laughs> Um, it's just in the last years that really I'm starting to have an, an, an embodied experience of it because it's not just like, oh, we all won until you fuck with me and I'm, I'm, I'm angry with you and like it creates separation, you know? It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I, I, how far can you, how, how far can you bring that in your daily life? Every time that actually something disturbs you, everything you criticize, everything you judge, everything that you feel separated from you, like how can you recall those places in you, even though they're not maybe expressed, maybe they're, yeah, they're suppressed, maybe you feel like you would never be that person or you'd never be that quality ever again, but how can you bring that force all the time into your, your inclusive awareness of of yourself? So it's a matter of perspective for me, you know, like the path of, Tantra, if you want to call it, or even just like awareness in general, is for me a path of uh, uh, bringing a, a deeper awareness from your center of gravity that is only you or your individualized self. It's starting to bring a bigger perspective to maybe what 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 is the what is your soul? What is the soul of the world? What is the soul of the earth? What is the soul of this universe? And like starting to vibrate from that place yeah beautiful i um yeah there is this i asked because there is this misconception that tantra has something to do with sex necessarily and mm -hmm. that's because we like many other spiritual practices we have westernized the origins of tantra which is chivism tantra and other lineages mm -hmm. which actually had nothing even mentioning sex in their original uh, transcripts and really the origins which also touches lovemaking because lovemaking is part of this um, maya that we are living um, and is part mm -hmm. of our life so tantra also has to do with sexuality it's not about that it's actually about one's own um, relationship with the divinity in all you know the ability to recognize divine in everything the, the sacredness in the day-to-day -day, in the moment-to-moment -moment experience in the bodily experience which a lot of lineages that came before that were all about this renunciation like let's go to the mountain become a renunciate that's like the highest spiritual goal the tantric came and said hey what about all of that i don't know Maybe we are here in this body, in this experience, in this life, going through the motions, doing work, raising families, you know, love making, and all of these things. And that is our path. That is how we find divinity. That is how we find, you know, God and, and beauty and um, all, mm. all that is sacred through that experience and finding that non dual space in which everything is spirit, everything is sacred, at least mm. as far as I understood. <laughs> Um, so I think it's important when speaking about Tantra to make this distinction because even people who study Tantra, which I met in Kopangan and other places, don't really know this distinction. They really have this idea that Tantra is somehow has to do with this Kama Sutra, Indian sex thing, which is not really the case. Um, mm. Yeah, so... Well, I would even add to this that mm -hmm. actually... Um, you know, like the, the sexual part of Tantra was actually exclusive to some high initiates um, back in the days. So it's like, I feel like the fact that we have taken just that part and make it um, what is the Neo Tantra today and what is almost the only interest of many people in those communities, um, I feel like that that became also the curse of our generation. Um, even though like I feel like our generation has like it's, it's beautiful because even though you, you you called me out on the fact that not everyone is actually seeking for path or for spiritual path I feel like because it, it became so much more mainstream 
somehow there is so much more people that at, at least ask themselves some questions that maybe before they wouldn't. Mm. Um, and I feel like that's the good side of it. But then I feel like the curse of it is that we have access to some practices and some um, knowledge that we're usually just exclusive for people who have already a level of initiation before. Therefore, I feel like it could become su such a trap. And that's why I, you know, I kind of take myself away from that field, which I'm like, I'm not a tantric teacher. <laughs> Don't associate me with that. Because, because for me, like, it's like, you know, it's always like the, the one that speaks the most about it is the one that have the less about it, you know? So it feels like about that. Like if, if Tantra is really limited to the sexuality and how to become a better lover and how to um, have more egoistic cocks, uh, I'm not interested in that at all yeah and yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. i've lived uh, as a person who you know work educating people around intimacy communication and all that stuff which never i never i didn't came from tantra i never studied it besides reading old scriptures and books and things like that but mm. all of the history of um and origins of shaivism tantra and less about like the you know the workshop westernized let me heal you with my cock type of tantra which i saw happening all around me in kopangan which really always like feeling as is like i don't know it doesn't feel to me like a path that is you know pure and effective and beautiful and you know uh, inclusive and i don't know something really didn't resonate with me and i only realized what was it when i started actually investigating what tantra actually is and hearing from people mm -hmm. who are initiated by uh, tantric teachers and you know their perspective on that which has nothing to do and usually these people don't even involve themselves in the circles um in the same circles that you you and i are speaking about in any case um so yeah this is just important to emphasize for anyone who is interested in you know the tantric teachings and tantric lineage be well go to the origins, you know, figure out what it actually means, what it means your day-to-day -day life, your experience in this life. And then, you know, lovemaking experience will enhanced, will be enhanced dramatically. How you connect with other people will be enhanced dramatically. If you, your relationship with your sensual life, with your, the things that you can sense with your senses becomes more sacred, becomes more divine, everything amplified amplified as well so it's not just this narrow focus on sexuality you mentioned embodiment a lot and i'm because this word is being thrown a lot what is embodiment for you going back to this to the body what does it mean and how do you how do you facilitate such experience for people hmm. what is embodiment um First of all, I'm very grateful for that word in English because um, in Italian and in French, which are my two main languages, there is not this word. So it also shows that this word has been like um, like birthing with almost a new, I want to call it movement, but it's not so much of a movement. It's maybe more an awareness of people that are descending more and more into, in, into the awareness of like what is this living organism um before trying to to understand the rest of the world um so for me embodiment it's almost like a descending path of of going inward of like allowing the the physical body to be the 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 real representation the real shape of what is going on inside that so there's no filters anymore like i i remember when i was younger like I even see pictures of me like ages ago and i'm like wow, like there's no expression, like there's nothing that is showing actually the depth of what I was living inside. So for me, like embodiment is like, the, it's, it's almost a reflection of life through your body. It's like allowing life to be expressed and manifest through your body. It's like, it's almost the opposite of what you were speaking about, about like uh, almost the ascending past that used to neglect the body you know like renounce to the body because the body was seen as sinful and so i want to almost speak about like the descending and the and, and the ascending past because it's, it's it's almost like two 
um, spiritual current that have been um, fighting against each other, you know, it's like whatever descended in the body was sinful. It's almost like the, the witch hunting craft, you know, it's like every, every person, which was a lot represented by women at the time, because like, women are more in touch with, with their body somehow. It, it was, it was like um, demonized almost this past. And now it's the opposite. Like we're rising again from the body and, 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 and starting to inhabit the body first before, um, yeah, before like preaching something like something else outside of us. So um, I don't know if that actually answers your question, but that's where I went. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I feel embodiment, it's the same thing. Maybe I'm just going to speak about it from my own perspective and then it will yeah. create even more, even, yeah, deeper clarity. Um, we have this illusion, this sense that we live our lives, that we are in control. When in fact, not just from a spiritual perspective, but really if you observe reality, the scale the part of reality which is conscious, our consciousness, is just a blip on a much, on an infinite timeline, on an infinite scale of from the tiniest particle to the fucking biggest, you know, physical uh, phenomena or physical uh, law. And in between, there is a moment of, of consciousness, of awareness there that is perceiving a very limited perspective of what is. Yet the body that we live in, the body that this consciousness is living within, is a product of that bigger picture, is that product of that scale, and not something that you control and you constantly manifest. Like you look at your child and you're like, oh, this is my child. Is it though? It's like a product of 13 billion years of evolution, this beautiful process just unfolding. And that body which the descendants are kind of like, you know, distancing themselves from. If you want to get higher spiritually, you distance yourself from the body. You, even from the Judaism, Judaism culture that I came from and many other religions and, you know, other uh, Hindu um, lineages and Buddhism, you go far from your body and you like starve it and fast and go to the mountains and just like, you know, you know, um, refrain yourself from sexual activities and so on and so forth to get more spiritual, to get higher. But there is something so innately intelligent and beautiful in this body. It's a, literally a product of these 13 billion years of evolution happening and unfolding exactly the way it is, making this magnificent machine, making out of genetic codes, DNA, RNA, mm -hmm. molecules, particles, organs everything working in synchronicity and we have this illusion that we are in control of the happenings of this body when in fact this is just happening and then our brain is kind of like explaining what is going on you know like when something is happening your instinct is immediate and then our mind is usually starting to have an explanation of why that happened you know and so it's the other way around and i feel that embodiment is dropping the mind dropping the thinking mind, this illusion that we are in control and letting our body, letting our this innate intelligence that permeate through the entire process and through our body to do its job, you know, which knows what to do. And so you can do it through dance, through movement, through singing, through whatever it is, but you go back to that, to that body. And I feel that specifically when it comes to sexuality and intimacy and the worlds that we are um, involved in a lot of people especially men who are but women as well people are disconnected from their bodies disconnected from the that intelligence and they are spending so much of the time here I'm like oh am i doing it right should i do this should i do this will he like me will we be in this relationship or that relationship or kind of expectations and programs and narratives and stories and whatnot and shame and guilt and what everything that we bring with us embodiment is the continuous process of letting go of as much as possible of that so we can let the body 
the innate intelligence within it, the innate sacredness and divinity within it, do its bidding, you know, do its work mm. while this mind is just empty and blissful. Mm. Um, at least this is my understanding of, of, of the word embodiment, or at least my, my personal experience of it. Um, what do you, how do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah I, I would just maybe add because like it it would feel like it's just a meditation process and I feel like a lot of sitting meditation this is what they try to like emptying their mind uh, but there's such a difference in actually then inhabiting the body it's not just it's not just emptying the mind but it's really allowing the consciousness to start awaken every molecule of your body so that then your body and it's actually freaking like it's freaking out a lot of people in many of my sessions like when your body takes over you might have a moment of terror a moment of terror because it's this lack of control and the body start moving in its own way start making the noises that it wants and it almost feel like someone else is commanding you and this someone else is nothing else than life itself you know but it's um yeah so that's maybe like the the, the only little tweak that i would say it's like it, it's not I mean, just yeah, I was thinking about the dance mind. and movement and intimacy so yeah, yeah and, i mean i was referring less to the meditation aspect of it and like sitting calmly and quieting the mind but rather moving the body or letting the body move instead of having this where should i move my body for example in dance you know like you dance you move and then you have this moment in the beginning which you are not really in your body yet and you're like oh should i move this should i move that how does how does it look am i am i doing it right blah 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 blah, blah. Totally. then there is this moment in which you like let go of that shit and you let your body just do its thing and then yeah it's what you, what you said is just coming continuing from there yeah yeah there's this threshold of letting go of commands yeah yeah yeah. surrender and acceptance and letting go became such an integral part of my life and my journey in a way that is incredibly transformative you know like really mm. if you would tell me let go of control or surrender to what it is or you know talk with me about these kind of things a few years ago i would not be able to fully accept it you know i still had so much in me that wanted to achieve that wanted to get somewhere that had bought was buying into the illusion that i do have any control over where am i going what is happening is it that is me living my life that is me figuring it out and not the other way around life living me and figuring me out what was the turning point for you that you were like was it ever a turning point were you always like this um in the in the perspective of surrender or was it like a turning point in your life that you were like shit i'm not in control and that's actually wonderful <clears throat> i think it is like it's a constant process because i would lie if i tell you that there was like a moment and ah, now i don't control anymore no like actually even now i shared with you there's a lot of shit happening in my life and i can see the parts of like I me mean, i want to control it still so it's like i feel like it's a constant uh, remembrance and awareness and especially in moments that are really hard that's like okay it's just a constant test into how much more can you can you trust and that's not trusting anything or anyone it's like can you just trust life even when shit hits the fan can you just trust that everything happens at that moment and that life is still holding you when you feel like everything has abandoned you so it's like it's, it, it's such a constant awareness to keep because it's never going to be like okay now now i'm enlightened you know now i'm good like yeah. i'm free from control um now now comes constantly it's a machine that is um inevitable and um yeah, I feel like there's been steps, you know, there's been definitely steps in my life, almost like milestones, you know, which is like, okay, I feel like we reached somewhere, but it's a never ending story. Yeah. Yeah, mm. definitely. And I love that you said the remembrance because it is what it is. It's not some new, new discovery. Rather, it feels like something you al always had inside of you and you just remember. Like this deep 
inside of you, this like heart that is beating and is absolutely trusting and in full faith of what is and is just surrendered. This is this energy, this frequency is there all the time. And then sometimes we go out of it and something painful is happening or like this relationship didn't work out or something didn't behave in the way I expected them to behave and I'm deeply hurt or, you know, things are not working out for me financially or otherwise a parent had died, whatever, all these beautiful, painful things that are happening to all of us at some point in our life. We forget a little bit. We buy into the illusion that, oh, matters a lot, you know, like this specific thing that is not working for me right now, it matters so much. And maybe I'm not being taken care of. It doesn't feel like it in this moment. And then we remember. It's a process of remembrance. What reminds you? You know, what are the things that remind you? What are the things or practices or humans or, you know, that remind you that you are taken care of, that you are being carried, carried away? So you've been breaking up right now, so I don't really know if you asked me something or if you were just sharing, if you just heard some words. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I asked what are some of the things that help you remember? Remember who you are, remember to surrender. Actually, like, you know, it's like every time that I can feel the helplessness in me, it's like every time I am obliged to be on my knees um, is a portal for me for... Uh, for knowing that I have nothing to lose like there's nothing to lose I'm not here in control of anything so um of course like and that's more of like on like you know the helplessness always come with me when when there is horrible things happening or where it's difficult or where you're overwhelmed by intensity in some sort um and then of course there's the opposite of that which is like those ecstatic moments just moment where everything dissolves so yeah it could be an orgasm or it could be like a, a beautiful moment in your life or just a, 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 when you when you went through the threshold of embodiment and you're just dancing in ecstasy and that nothing is wanted from you like that nothing is yeah every time that I feel like nothing is wanted from me and that I don't have to do anything like yeah, it just makes me relax. And I feel like the helplessness come with that. You know, it's like every time that I feel like, well, I have nothing to do. Like I can't do anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very counterproductive to a lot of people because um, at least in my experience, since this, what we're speaking about right now became my living experience, I started speaking about mostly nothing but it, you know, and I, I see different reactions coming from people. And it's really interesting for me what is coming up and slowly figuring out better ways to articulate this very direct, very personal, very subjective experience of blissful powerlessness. Um, and when I speak about it with people, a lot of times the first reaction is like terror or fear or, you know, like what will happen? Like where would action come from? Like, and how would things happen? And I'm like, look, I mean, I can give you many examples, but maybe if we are speaking right now, let's look at me, you know? I feel like I'm doing nothing, yet everything is being done. Sometimes I spend days in divine laziness, doing absolutely nothing, yet things are still happening, you know? Like, um, and sometimes inspiration comes and pushes me to, you know, to, to, to do something and to embark on a project, but it feels like it, I'm being pushed, like I'm being moved, like I'm being carried, not like, a, okay, I need this objective to happen and now I'm going to do one, two, three, four and all of that will happen. Um, and there is tremendous, tremendous freedom in that letting go mm. continuously. Like, oh, okay. Mm. Let me go again. Oh, this little bit. Okay, let me go again. But what about... Let me go again. <laughs> you know, like... Um, and uh, yeah, there is, uh, other than just, you know, it's something that you cannot explain rationally in a way that is experiential. So I think the best thing is to, hey, you know, is being in control makes you happy? 
is being in control contributes to your sense of love and well-being and peace? The answer is never yes. You know, like in this, so far people understand. You know, like need to be in control feels tense, feels dense. You know, like you can feel it in your body. We talked about embodiment. You can feel it in your body. When you are in control, you are all, all your muscles are tense, it's in pain. And this letting go, this movement of like opening your fist and letting go and just like, oh, it feels good. It feels good. It's freeing, it's in your body. What's mm. your experience with talking about this with people, with your clients, with your like, how do you yeah i almost wanted yeah. to bring like a concrete example and something that popped in my mind that i you know I've, good, I'm good, good. constantly i don't know if you if you, i don't know but i've i am constantly asked about the way i relate and am i open am i close like all those things and um i feel like that's a big a beautiful example because um i, I always said in in my relationships i do I have boundaries or not? That's a big talk, you know, about boundaries. And I, I, I would say I don't, I don't have bound, like I don't give any boundaries to my partner um, of any sort. And it's not because I am over jealousy or I'm over anything, you know. It's like, but if I give any boundaries to my partner and is gonna do things or not gonna do things because of what we said. I will always doubt that he is here with me or he is doing what he's doing because he wants to do it. You know, it's like, and that's like almost a trap. It's like, I feel maybe I'm going to speak for many people I will recognize, but like, you know, we want to give boundaries constantly so that we can control the reality and feel and create that safe uh, place, which is a trap anyway, even if you created the most safer environment and it's not even almost just in relationship i'm just taking that example because it comes all the time but uh, if i control anything in order to have a safe place i'm always going to doubt that this is safe because i've created it or is it because it's really you know so yeah just a practical one yeah. yes 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 which i would imagine like i'm absolutely 100 percent full body fuck yes to this but um, I think some people, when they hear, oh, put no boundaries, the immediate thing that will come up is like, well, yeah, but I, I, need, I need sometimes in certain situations, I do need to keep myself safe. And I love that example because this fear, you know, this fear of I'm not safe. Let's, let's explore that for a second. What does it even mean? not safe of what what can happen to you what is the worst that can happen to you for a lot of people that worst thing that could happen to you if it's sexually or otherwise happen to them and some of them define themselves by that trauma for the rest of their life and live their entire life and every relationship they are having with that trauma carrying it is like you know it's like an armor and some people that i met which i'm not speaking from my own experience i'm just referring to you know, meals that I see from other people, or people that I work with, people that I met over the years, lovers, you know, women in my life. And there are other people that have experienced severe trauma in societal measurements, yet they are in absolute peace in front of it. They have forgiven completely. There is no resentment that they are holding towards this person. They even are thankful how far out that is, they are thankful for having been experiencing that pain because it puts them on a certain path which leads them to where they are at today, which is more open, more able to trust in many different things that unfolded in their life just because that happened, you know? And so I think initially there is some resist resistance that I sense from people when I'm talking about exactly that, like the meaning of trauma and you know, how we can let go of that and surrender to that and perhaps getting into what you spoke about, having less to no boundaries because there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, the worst case, you're going to learn something. Um, and your body will know to protect you and you have this innate intelligence inside of you. So you don't need to build these 
mind construct of boundaries, boundary, boundaries, because it's just an illusion of control. There, even if you put all the boundaries, there are still things that can happen to you and be painful, you know? So there's no real control there. Um, there is resistance coming to that. And I feel that it's helpful to speak about people's experiences that have experienced things that are painful and traumatic and how they look at them today without defining themselves by those traumatic experiences, being able to look at them with peace, with acceptance, you know? What is your experience with that, with your life or people that you've worked with, um, people who mm -hmm. have experienced trauma and were able to get to the, um, a place of peace and surrender and a full acceptance of the sacredness and the divinity in their pain? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and live a life of trust with less boundaries. You, you have examples of that. It's uh, it's a big topic, and the capacity of resilience is almost like a mystery. You know, it's like I, even when I was studying that as a psychologist, um, it, it it wasn't we weren't we weren't able to really explain why why some, some, some people with huge trauma had a capacity of resilience in almost an instant and other people with way less um, um, trauma would just carry that all their life, you know? So I guess like it's not something that we can take lightly and that we can like generalize to people. Um, as everyone, I'm a traumatized person. I feel like, you know, birth in itself is traumatizing and coming into a world um, of duality is a trauma in itself, you know, for the part of us that knows that we are everything, like for the part of, of us that is not even human, coming into a human existence is traumatizing. And I feel like that then everything is an addition to that initial trauma, which is I I I am I I I was I I was love I was born love and everything in this life just show me that I am not the love that I was supposed to be you know that's like for me that's the only trauma that exists and then there is a var variant uh, of that that take different shape or form but um, trauma in itself is a place for me where you you just like a part of you a fractal of yourself like split your psyche is split and in that place you are so alone you feel so abandoned and alone that um, there is no hope for love anymore in there and so that part that is split is always you know like trying and failing to come back to love um so that's how i explain trauma in general but then like like again like the capacity of resilience which is almost the capacity to open yourself like to to allow that fraction to be seen and met so that it can collapse um it's a mystery you know it's like it's a mystery it's like always a place where you don't want to push people too much because if you push people and they're not ready to let go of the identification of their trauma because to me, many people are just identified. It's another identification. So it's like, yeah, I am the survivor uh, of cancer, you know, which it has been one of my identity for a long time because I had a cancer when I was 18. Uh, I am, um, I don't know, a sexual abused child and whatever. So it's like it's, it's an identity in which um, this part that doesn't know or doesn't remember that it's love is trying to seek love externally from that. So it's a rewarding of love through that place. And the, the, the fact is that, um, yeah, if, if there is not um, the capacity to, to integrate that love as nothing that you need to be or do in order to become that love, then it's like just a constant wounding that repeats itself over and over again and that's why you know when I was working in, in as a psychologist you would see like often it's like one person that had a cancer once will have three or four of them one woman that has been raped once will be raped like five times in their life whereas other never you know so it's like trauma will attract more trauma because mm -hmm. as I said if you take trauma as a place as a fraction of love so that empty place will just reproduce constantly and trying to validate that it doesn't deserve love. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So what is the what is the alternative? 
<laughs> what is the alternative like it will depend like i think it's really depending on anyone and um it, it's to take anyone really individually in that path if we're speaking about helping people into this so um it's it's like this this um edge between being there you want to actually almost take the fraction in which you can you can you can you can invite that aloneness you know this place where you feel totally alone to actually emerge and let yourself be seen in that terror because it's a place of terror where you feel totally abandoned and in the same time it's like it's edgy because you don't want the story of the trauma to start to come out and then just being validated into a victimhood so it, it takes a lot of almost expertise to look into um, when it's the right time, where like when is the person really radically open in that moment where you can start to invite force um, that part that feels totally terrified, terrified of, of, of anything. Um, yeah. I'm not really being like uh, clear. I'm not going to give you a five step uh, came out of trauma. There is no. I, don't think that it's, no, I was, I was asking uh, less about five step, but more about, um, I mean, you mentioned identification with that trauma and what it entails and how it keeps repeating itself. The more we identify with that trauma, so I'm asking, what is the, what is the alternative? Is it coming to a realization, coming to peace with that, with the trauma that have been realizing you mentioned it a little bit here and there and maybe we can uh, emphasize a little a bit more about it but acknowledgement of the parts in you that recognize that that trauma that you have experienced and any other pain in your life is the same boundless unconditional omnipresent love taking a different form that is feels painful to you right now, but it's still part of that bigger picture unfolding. Um, is that, do you see that um, manifestation of, 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 of acknowledgement helpful in you know, facilitating acceptance and peace and disidentification with people's trauma? Well, I, I always feel like there's two paths to anything, you know, it's like there's always like a path where you just um, go slower. And so like, it's more of a feminine path, you know, so you're gonna, gonna allow like you're gonna be gentle, you're gonna just not push anything, like you're gonna relax the body so that actually the body can let go of anything that needs to come out by itself. Or there is another path which is going to be a little bit more masculine and more pushy, which is like you're actually going to push until the person is going to vibrate the same amount, um, like it, it, that the body vibrates the same energy that it was vibrating when it was traumatized at the moment that the trauma occurred, so that there is um, there is a possibility for that energy to be freed. You know, mm. so it's like. They always to approach you there. It's like the dance between them both, you know, which is always the dance yeah. of these polarities, you know, everything in existence. You have like yin yang, dark light, feminine, masculine, um, electric charges, minus plus, remembrance and forgetfulness, you know, the the sacredness and 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 all that <laughs> around us that seemingly that is seemingly void of, of sacredness uh, at least in mm -hmm. what we can grasp with our senses so that tension between these two i feel is also coming to play here you know like mm -hmm. you have this place in which okay i'm experiencing pain right now and i'm letting it be and i'm taking it slow and i'm engaging in self-love and acceptance and compassion and then there is also the part of which you move forward in order to not get into a place of which these traumas keep repeating because I'm I'm just identifying with that and I'm allowing it to happen to me. But you're moving forward and like, okay, well, how do I want this life to, uh, to be? How do I want this life to experience? What do I want to experience with men, for example, after experiencing such trauma or such, what kind of relationships I do believe that are possible and viable for me to experience and there is this like dance between that feminine masculine 
you know, penetrative and um, surrendered and like this, I don't know, it's, I feel I'm experiencing my life in a very similar way on a day-to-day -day basis. Like sometimes it's like a move forward momentum and a lot of times it's staying back and taking it slow and letting mm. it happen. Um, yeah. And also, like I, I want to add, and especially with the example that I give about like known known boundaries, uh, I'm known for that in my workshops. So I'm like, I don't want to speak about boundaries. Um, sometimes, and especially if there is a lot of trauma, it is really it's actually really important to start knowing your no, your yes, what you want, what you don't want, so that then you can actually uh, surrender into what what arises and not um, letting those um, almost needs define your reality to the point that you actually constantly feel unsafe. So it's like it's going further to going back again. You know, it's like like and, and I feel like life is always like this. I don't like to be certain of anything. It's just um, yeah. So I believe that it's important for many people to know what they what are their boundaries. But then it's like, don't stop there. Because if you're going to start defining your world in the way that you want to define it, you lose almost um, the magic of it. You know, you, 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 you're just going to start controlling everything because you're fucking scared that anything could happen to you. And maybe that is the first step. You know, if you're actually terrified, maybe that's the first step to re-empower yourself having the power to define or to be heard in places where you were not heard you know that you 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 did not have any anything to say and you've been overpowered so maybe that's just a step you know but then mm -hmm. like um, and I think we already spoke about that it's like for me it's like okay find your power find your power find your or find your individuation actually build your individuation so that then you can let it go because if you let it go before you've built it, if like there's so much like people feeling, oh, I'm so humble, I don't want power. Fuck that, we all want power. When we feel from an individual standpoint, we want power, we want to be recognized, we want to feel that we are the best or whatever, you know? And once you are on the top of it, then you can actually offer it, you know? But if you offer it before, it doesn't stand for real. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Like, if you lose your sense of self before you have developed one, mm. that can be a very dangerous experience. You know, it's like with psychedelics, I've heard uh, people speak about how it can be harmful to, you know, experience psychedelic trips when you are very young, maybe like 14, 15, 16, when your sense of self the very one that in older ages we want to, we do everything in our power to let go of, but the very sense of self is not fully developed. Um, engaging in a psychedelic experience that is powerful and, you know, healing your ego in many senses, healing that sense of self, when you don't have that sense of self yet, can be very disassociating and can be mm. potentially harmful. And I think it's mm. this analogy is very similar to, to here, like, people come to to you people come to me with you know wanting to step into their power wanting to experience life more fully if you immediately take them to the path of surrender um, and completely letting go to to total powerlessness i mean surrender is always there is surrendering to where you're at and accepting where it is so you can step into your power but you don't want to take them too much into powerlessness not yet before they have crystallized their power and stepped into it and actually experienced it in their life and like oh okay i'm capable i'm able good beautiful powerful relationships is some is a reality that is possible for me making money from what i love and not suffering in some stupid job is something that is possible for me you know experiencing joy and peace and love in my life is possible for me okay now i can let go now i can let go of, of my need of control and boundaries and power and all of that yeah, and I, if I, not, I would even add that if you, if not, it will like, you know, cause I see that so much and it's like actually not being honest about the thirst of uh, individuate, the thirst of being someone, you know, it's like, and if, 
And if that is not totally clear or it's not totally in the light, it's just going to act in the shadow. So it's like, oh, I'm so humble, I'm so humble. But then like, you know, in the back, like there's always like a thread in the shamanics that is trying to pull and That's have true. power in some, in some ways, you know? Yeah. And you see it a lot in, you know, certain shamani, shamanists and spiritual teachers that have stepped into their power and just kept stepping into their power forever and amplifying it and gaining more and more and more power out of this thirst. Um, and although they might be very well, very spiritual, very, you know, knowledgeable, very wise humans, they haven't let go the very power that they achieved spiritually in order for them to really be able to be of service, of beautiful service that is incoherent with the way things are, with the process that people need to go through and not what you want to impose on them based on what serves you and your power. So yeah, I really resonate with, um, with that as well. So beautiful. I mean, I thought we were going to talk a lot about, um, you know, sexuality and intimacy and we did, but somehow, you know, we talked about what we meant to talk about. I, 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 I would imagine what is alive for both of us in our life right now. Mm. This is why I don't plan these calls too much. It's because this is exactly what I want to, to invoke. Um, yeah. thank you so much for being here um, for people You're who welcome. want to follow you where should they, where should they <laughs> do people it? want to follow me at the moment so like I said I'm going through something which means that a lot of my stuff is down at the moment so the only place where you can find me at the moment is Instagram so yeah Good. I'm going to leave your Instagram in the show notes in the, in the links um, and you're probably going to be able to see it on my socials as well. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Laura. Sweet. Yeah. And thank you for the conversation. It was a pleasure. And yeah, pleasure to meet you more deeply also. And yeah, always to speak about those things. It's arousing. <laughs>